Hi, I'm Saverio De Vito, a researcher from ENEA in Italy and a partner of the Vidis project. Welcome to this uh, first lesson, first lecture of the topic in-field calibration and beyond that is designed to lay the basis of uh, field calibration in the wild, so in, uh, in real world condition, and to have a glimpse of what lies beyond field calibration in order to achieve uh, the long sought scalability of uh, this process that is designed to achieve uh, high accuracy from uh, low cost uh, chemical sensors systems. Here come uh, to the topics of the uh, of this lecture. So we will look have a look at the motivation. So why uh, we need to calibrate sensors? We will have a look of what are the limitation of uh, low cost air quality multi sensor systems and how we can uh, achieve a, a, a reliable and accurate measurement, relatively accurate measurement with this kind of uh, sensor. So we will have a look at calibration. Uh, basics um, and we have also a look at the particular matter sensor stargate example then we will have also a gas sensor stargate exa example uh, and then we will uh, proceed further to understand how to select the right uh, calibration model and then uh, finally we will uh, have a look at the limits of field calibration and try to understand what lies beyond, and that will be the subject of uh, future lectures. The basic motivation for which we uh, have a run of calibration for uh, chemical uh, multi sensor systems designed for air quality relies on the limitation of this kind of sense. What we do uh, basically uh, is to analyze a process and the process in which chemical and particulate sensors, in particular low cost one, translate the target concentration, the target the concentration of the pollutants into some uh, number of variables which should be translated back in the concentration estimation. So what we do is basically inverting a sensor model by using a calibration function. Some vendors, for example, suggest how to derive this calibration function or directly uh, suggest a kind of one size fits all calibration to be used for all sensors of that specific class. However, uh, so on the left side of this slide, you see uh, one common sensor is the figure of TGS. 832, uh, which basically produces a response when it is subjected to a certain uh, concentration of a particular analyte. And uh, what we do is to analyze the response of the sensor, in this case it will be a resistance, and try to uh, understand the concentration to which this sensor has been exposed to. This is what we do when we derive a calibration function, sometimes called a calibrator. What is, uh, what is the problem with this, uh, with this kind of sense? So, first of all, we have to take into account that the um, uh, fabrication quality is not so high as a microelectronic uh, fabrication process. So, we uh, obtain, finally, uh, a fabrication variance, which make each of the sensors different from uh, one another. Another source of relevant issues with the calibration of these sensors is the uh, interference from non-target gases, which means that also target, uh, which means also that uh, gases for which the sensor has not been uh, designed actually elicit a response and so, in some kind, pollute the, uh, the response to a particular target analyte. And then we have interference from environmental parameters that probably are the most uh, important source of issues with, uh, with the calibration of these uh, sensors, 
which means that varying environmental parameters like temperature or uh, relative humidity or even pressures may elicit a response of the sensors. Uh, in such a way, the response that we actually read is not the result only of the of the target gas, but also of a set of different parameters which actually interfere with the production of the, of the response. The last one is the drift. So each of, the, of these sensors is uh, subdued to aging and, uh, and, and poisoning, um, which means that the sensors along the time lose its original uh, performances and uh, actually is resist, uh, is um, uh, his response, his responsiveness to the to the uh, to the target concentration changes along the time, and and this uh, actually hampers the the, the accuracy of uh, a calibration function. So all these factors contribute to hinder the original one size fit all vendor calibration, strongly limiting the sensor's accuracy. One example of environmental interference is given here in this, uh, in this figure, which comes from a, from a very old paper of our group. Uh, so here you can find uh, amongst sensors, like the one we see before, that is exposed to NH3 in a humid uh, carrier. So we note that depending on the difference RH uh, levels, uh, the sensors have a different response. So, to the same concentration. So, if we look here, the concentration of NH3 is uh, depicted with this line. Okay, and if you see, this is almost constant in this area. Okay, of time. Okay, what really changes is the RH level that goes from uh, from practically um, in this case for 30 percent. Uh, up to something like a 60%. I don't, I don't I really don't remember exactly, but what, what is important here is to understand that this change over time in at different levels. And here you see the response of the sensors when it is put into this different condition. Okay, and the maximum height of the of the sensors, the steady state response, we will see, you will say. It is, uh, it is different. In this different condition, even if the concentration of the target analyte, which is NH3, does not vary along this line. This is constant in the exposure intervals, but you see that the response is somehow quenched by the relative humidity. Another example can be seen in this slide. Here, uh, Plant Tower PMS 7003, which is actually an optical particle counter, is exposed to different concentration of particulate in the field. And here you can see the first difference between uh, laboratory operation and uh, field operation. Here we cannot control uh, the span and actually uh, the, uh, the target concentration varies along all the range with uh, continuously. Uh, we can note that the sensor response to the same concentration of PM 2.5, for example, let's say 40 micrograms per cubic meter, uh, uh, you see that the same, um, that different responses on average is elicited at different relative humidity. Here, this is a relative humidity gauge and you can see when it is um, uh, dots with the uh, with the yellow color, colored by yellow, are representative of very high relative humidity, and you see that there is a tendency to overestimate the concentration, and the largest the relative humidity, the largest the larger is the um, overestimation tendency. Actually, there is a, a good news. Most of this issue can be tackled with a one-shot ad hoc calibration process, which derives a specific calibration fu function for each of the considered multi-sensors device. In this case, we are just looking at the response of a single uh, sensor. So we can derive 
this kind of uh, calibration function when uh, where the concentration is actually a function of uh, these two uh, these two vectors one that is uh, that contains all the relevant sensors row outputs and uh, the other one kt kot that, which is a function of, of the time, by the way, is a vector of all relevant known and observable interference. So, first of all, we have to understand uh, which are the interference, and we have to provide a way to uh, obtain information uh, on the interference, quantitative information on the uh, on interference. So, we can try to find a model F, inverting a model. Uh, sensor model, which is capable to um, estimate the concentration starting from the data that we obtain from the sensors and the observable and known interference. The bad news is that F is not easy to derive at all. You need a suitable physical chemical inspired model of your sensor to invert or a black box model which sit your sensor response function, either linear or nonlinear. You need a sufficiently complete data set to practically and accurately derive uh, the relevant parameters of your F function. You need access to reference data, of course, to compare your sensor's response and to correctly derive your calibration function, which need also reference data um, and input data from your sensors. All these components in principle should be obtained and put together in a low cost and scalable process. This is another really important issue. We will, we will have uh, later a discussion on it. Of course, we can try uh, to read this calibration from laboratory calibration or for field data, data recorded actually in the field. What is dif this, the difference between these two uh, approaches. Of course, using laboratory derived data uh, has uh, its own peculiarity. For example, in laboratory, we can rely on controlled atmosphere chambers, so we can finely tune the uh, concentrations of the different analytes and recreate a specific atmosphere. So we have this controlled con condition which we, we can uh, let uh, vary the concentration and obtain both uh, uh, zero and span condition from each of the relevant forces or or the of the of the response of the of the sensor. Uh, however, an observable and unknown interference cannot be taken into in, into account, and also sometimes. Well, most of the time, our laboratory are not uh, suited to take into account all the possible interference of a particular sensor. For example, we may, uh, we may not have the possibility to elicit the response to ozone because we don't have the uh, ozone generator, for example, in our laboratory. So sometimes we cannot complete the set of forces because we don't have the equipment to do this. By the way, the, 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 the most important idea Lying, be, uh, lying um, in the laboratory um, uh, calibration um, is the possibility to actually finally uh, tune uh, the characteristics of the atmosphere that we present to the sensors. So we actually can control all the concentrations of the relevant uh, forces. On the other side, field calibration uh, actually relies on data that are recorded in field uh, in so-called collocation experiment. In this kind of experiment, our low-cost uh, multisensor systems is located um, in close proximity, uh, if not in, the same, in exactly the same position, uh, with a reference analyzer. So we rely on reference stations that actually uh, operate in the field in real-world condition. Um, the drawback is that we cannot control 
this condition. So span and the mix depends on local condition. And when I talk about local, I'm talking about both space and time. So condition that uh, can be obtained in that particular season, in that particular time, in that particular position in the world. Uh, and, but unknown and unobservable interference are partially taken into account by the response of some targeted, interference targeted sensors, uh, also by uh, relying on the partial uh, selectivity usually um, shown by uh, low-cost sensors. Okay, so here, the basic idea is that we operate in conditions that are much closer to the real condition with all the um, uh, uh, unknown and even the uh, unobservable interference, they are present there and actually may elicit that particular uh, influence on the response of the census. And we can learn about the, uh, the, the response that actually that census have in real environments. Let's have an example of an actual uh, calibration of a, of a sensor. And uh, we uh, go back to the PMS 7003, the plant tower uh, optical particulate counter uh, that we use in our uh, devices. So and let's try to calibrate these sensors towards PM 2.5. Okay, we already know that this kind of sensors have uh, their own uh, fabrication uh, calibration, so the calibration that is available when you buy uh, these sensors. So the sensors is already capable to uh, estimate the concentration of uh, the particulate, the fraction uh, concentration of different uh, fraction of particulate. In the in this uh, in this example, we are talking about we are uh, we refer to the uh, 2.5. Uh, fraction of uh, particulate matter. So we have uh, we have already uh, an estimation to work with, which is not always the case with uh, low-cost chemical sensors. Uh, we have seen already that there is an overestimation tendency in general. You see that this is the actually um, uh, correct estimation uh, line, hmm? uh, which uh, divided into the, the, the first panel of our uh, our, uh, our axis uh, reference systems. In fact, you, you actually put in uh, correspondence the same concentration here on the true concentration axis and to the uh, estimation axis. And we see that uh, this census is actually overestimating uh, consistently over all the span that has been uh, encountered during a particular uh, collocation experiment in which we have put together this kind of census with a, a reference analyzer, a regulatory grade reference analyzer in this case. So uh, we see that the sensor actually has a, a tendency to overestimate uh, over all the uh, or, uh, the span over all the range of concentration that have been actually encountered during uh, this collocation uh, event. And also we see that this tendency is exacerbated by high uh, humidity, uh, relative humidity levels. So uh, the larger the relative humidity, the larger this, this tendency to overestimate. Okay, and of course we also see another feature of this census is that the largest the concentration the largest is the uh, the bias the overestimation bias but this is actually uh, um, a good uh, uh, a good news because uh, the census appear to be linear over this span okay let's try to uh, correct this tendency with a very simple um, uh, black box which is a multilinear um, regressor, okay, in which the concentration that we want to estimate is a function of two parameters A and B that actually multiply the um, row estimation of particulate matter expressed by these sensors and um, 
the relative humidity readings that should be provided by, um, by another sensor, uh, which actually is targeted only to relative humidity. So starting by this source of information, the actually uh, raw estimate of 2.5 fraction of uh, particulate uh, matter concentration and the amount of relative humidity that is present in the atmosphere when the census perform its estimation. And we try to solve this with a conventional ordinary least square method. So what we, what we obtain is a, a better curve in which the uh, overestimation is, uh, um, uh, is uh, eliminated, while we have a, a slight underestimation on the, on the largest concentration uh, uh, range. Okay. And also we see that all the colored uh, dots are now mangled together, so we don't see that uh, stratification which highlight, um, which highlight an interference from the relative humidity. So we have corrected the two effects um, by introducing, there is uh, actually an introduction of another source of error, but most of the estimation that are uh, concentrated in this range uh, are actually um, uh, more close to the true concentration or, uh, with respect to the, the previous, uh, uh, with the previous uh, raw uh, estimation of the sensor. And the same can be obtained also for uh, the PM10 uh, fraction. Actually, we uh, obtain uh, uh, a very similar um, behavior also on PM10. So once that we have seen um, an example on how to derive uh, a calibration function with a very simple approach, uh, a multilinear regression with a regressor with an ordinary least square uh, approach to the parameter optimization, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's see how we can analyze quantitatively the the accuracy and the performance of this sensor. So, uh, how we can obtain a uh, uh, synthetic indication of the accuracy level. We need, what we need is a set of indicators which can capture both precision and accuracy. We need also them to be universally recognized and grasped by all the stakeholders because we want to communicate the accuracy of our sensors to the scientific community and also to the uh, community of commercial uh, operators. So we need to, to stick with some set that is usually uh, recognized uh, by all the relevant stakeholders. If we resort to scientific uh, literature and also to regulatory standards, we usually find a very consistent set of uh, different uh, um, indicators, but uh, of course not all the publication uh, and all the regulatory standards refer to all this kind of, uh, um, of, of indicators, but you will find, usually you will find a subset of these ones. Let's see some of them. Uh, one of the most common indicators that is, uh, is used is the mean absolute error. It uh, captures the accuracy and also precision by evaluating the average absolute estimation error. So you see that it is an average, an averaging process over the absolute difference between the estimation and the true uh, concentration. Um, then you will find, um, usually uh, you will find an estimation of the mean bias error which highlights uh, the existence of a systematic under or overestimation issue, something that is constant over all the span. So if you find a positive mean bias error, for example, um, you have an indication uh, of this sensor's um, uh, tendency to overestimate the, uh, the true concentration. Uh, then you can find the mean relative or sometimes referred to mean percentage error, which normalizes the absolute error for each estimation to the true value. And then output a, a, a percentage uh, of error uh, 
that is uh, uh, that is outputted by the sensors on average on uh, on its estimation. Uh, there you will see uh, the MAPE, the, which is the mean absolute percentage uh, error, which is slightly different. It normalizes the mean absolute error to the range of the uh, relevant uh, target. Okay, so no indicator is perfect. Of course, for example, low mean absolute error can reflect an unnoticed high relative error when dealing with low end values of the target distribution. Uh, so you see a low mean absolute error, but actually there is a high relative error in that uh, particular range of concentration. Or MAPA P may become extremely high when dealing with values close to zero on the other side. And it is something that, for example, is not relevant to you and you see this large MAP value and you wonder what is the, what is the uh, the information that is conveyed by the by this uh, information uh, by this uh, by this value, and then you just understand that you are talking about very low values, which can be or not uh, relevant to you. But of course, since you have the true value at the uh, denominator, what uh, what actually happens is that when the denominator goes close to zero, what happens is that the value. Uh, uh, reach very very high value and this may sound alarming to you and probably this is not the correct indicator to evaluate that particular condition. So scaling MAP with the range of possible targets may help and this is an approach that is followed in uh, uh, a number of publications. Um, of course uh, known of this indicator is also uh, complete. Uh, so you have to resort to a set of this, uh, um, uh, of this, uh, uh, of, of this indicator. And you also, you may notice, for example, uh, that some indicator definition differ according to different authors, which is something that is uh, quite strange, but sometimes you find this kind of let's say, error, but this depends on different, let's say, tradition uh, uh, or the original uh, discipline in, in which they have operated in, in, uh, in, in the past. Um, uh, other, other, uh, other indicators are, for example, the one that relates and look at uh, correlation that uh, uh, which is expressed, uh, the, co the, the correlation that you may find between uh, the uh, actual estimation uh, obtained from the calibration and the real values. Uh, one of the most common is the Pearson's correlation factor, to the strength of a linear relationship between the estimation and the reference time series. Uh, and then we have the so-called coefficient of determination, which is indicated with uh, squared, squared r and uh, squared, okay, which is not in the general case the, the square of the Pearson's correlation factor. Uh, this is computed with that uh, with with the, with, the, uh, with this uh, formula. And actually, may take negative values, for example, which is not the case from for uh, the square of uh, are. Another really simple and interesting and, uh, indicator is the so-called FOEX, the factor of exceedance. It measures the over or underestimation of, uh, of measurement against the reference, uh, the reference data. So it's actually the percentage of, uh, of the estimation which, are, uh, which is overestimated. Okay, and also, of course, one very common is the uh, root mean squared error, that is magnitude of error, which is a little bit more sensitive to outliers with respect to mean absolute uh, uh, error. For example, RMC is sensitive to outliers, and the same concept uh, for uh, MEA also uh, applies uh, relatively to the, to the range of concentration. You may see it very low. Uh, while, for example, the relative error that you are committing is, uh, is significant. Uh, the FOEX has the same value 
for perfect fit and for total underestimation, which is something that you have also to, uh, uh, to uh, take attention to. Or R squared should be carefully tested for the uh, actual definition that has been used, because you will find different um, different definition in in, a, in different papers some, uh, sometimes. While I am here reporting what I think is the uh, what <laughs> what is the uh, correct um, uh, formula to use in our estimations. Uh, pieces are just measure a linear relationship strength, but accuracy may be low to the bias, and so so only a set of indicators may uh, contribute to. Uh, a regression analysis to a complete regression analysis. And here you may find uh, a common way to convey the results of a, of a calibration, which is a, a table in which you see a set of indicators which are evaluated okay, for different models. Okay. Here, for example, we are uh, using re um, we are using, uh, we are showing the result uh, of uh, the uh, averaging process of time stratified set uh, cross validation performance. Uh, in this case, we uh, add two weeks of data using for training and one week for test, and has been compiled over 30 uh, different uh, multi sensor uh, devices supporting uh, uh, a PM 7003. Uh, sensor. So what you see here on the rows are the results obtained by the original calibration, the results obtained by multilinear regression. Uh, this is generalized multilinear regression, which some of you may uh, already uh, have encountered in uh, different uh, works that they have. Um, performed and a simple shell of neural networks, so something in a neural architecture that, which is very simple, just one hidden layer, it's not a deep uh, uh, architectures, uh, but it's something that uh, can be very effective in our, um, in our scenario. Uh, and here you see the different set of indicators that we have used. And here you can find, for example, that we have chosen to highlight the results obtained by multilinear regression, which show also that we obtained a significant, and we have tested it uh, statistically, uh, reduction of the mean absolute error by using uh, that uh, calibration which we have uh, uh, introduced uh, before. So we go from 11.08, of course, micrograms per cubic meters to 7.8 micrograms for cubic uh, meters. So there is uh, a very significant reduction of the mean absolute error. Uh, and also we see another information, which is that the, um, uh, the, the, the multilinear regression uh, um, over, um, overscored the uh, general multilinear regression and also of score the uh, neural networks when it comes to mean absolute error. Okay. Uh, similar uh, performance uh, are obtained by, uh, uh, by looking at the uh, squared, uh, the coefficient of determination, when we see that uh, multilinear regression larger over, largely uh, overperform uh, the original uh, calibration, which uh, um, which, uh, which obtain a very, a very low a squared uh, uh, factor, uh, and, mm, but the results are closely shadowed by uh, the neural network. Uh, and similar behavior can be, uh, can be seen in the other, uh, in the other indicators. So, so in this case, we see that um, uh, the multilinear regression constant, um, um, consistently uh, overcome the other model that we are comparing to. Well, one thing that we have to consider is, is that, is that process truly simple? Is it scalable? Can you, uh, can you enforce
fourth seat can you use it when you are considering for example hundreds of different devices so we should not fool ourselves this simple calibration approach required a multi weeks multiple weeks of collocation with a reference analyzer so you uh, uh, have, you should have the possibility uh, to um, collocate your multi sensors device with a reference analyzer and you have the possibility to do this over multiple weeks and this is not simple to uh, achieve especially for commercial operators uh, and you have to derive the calibration for all your different devices this is what the original field calibration approach uh, is all about you have to collocate all your sensor device with a reference analyze you ob observe and record the responses across all the um, collocation times which has to span an adequate um, amount of time that is uh, sufficient to um, to show different weather condition different conditions of uh, um, uh, of the uh, pollutant fingerprints uh, so different anthropogenic uh, um, conditions and so on uh, and you have otherwise you have to uh, derive the calibration for each and all the device which is time consuming of course but the uh, the factor that really limits is the availability of a reference analyzer so this strongly limits the scalability especially when you deal with hundreds of analyzers because it's not so easy to perform these two tasks with all these uh, systems to calibrate so while this approach remains the most accurate approach at the moment to actually obtain the most in terms of accuracy from um, uh, low-cost air quality multi-sensor systems then we should go beyond and that's why we will have uh, next uh, lectures to um, uh, to go beyond uh, field calibration. but let's uh, take a look at the gas sensor calibration example uh, up to now we have just seen the results of applying simple correction methods to uh, the plant tower PMS 7003 uh, sensors um, and the results that we have uh, obtained here can be obtained uh, also with other kind of optical particle counters uh, which usually supports uh, uh, an original calibration that uh, was completed by the vendor which is quite accurate um, but uh, as we have seen we can obtain uh, uh, we can improve that uh, calibration with uh, co by correcting for the relative humidity influence and also we, we corrected also the the tendency to overestimate that that particular sensor shown uh, of course um, that particular behavior is shown by all that uh, all the sensors of that class that we have uh, uh, that we have analyzed so uh, our correction method applied to all the sensors not, not the same not exactly the same parameters of course but that methods can be applied to all the PMS 7003 sensors and also beyond uh, whenever uh, an optical particle counter uh, gives you uh, uh, an estimation of the concentration you can apply that kind of approach but let's see what happens to the uh, gas sensors in the gas sensors ring maybe we will make a particular um, uh, example with a peculiar class of sensors which is the electrochemical sensors which by the way are the sensors that are more, most commonly uh, employed nowadays for uh, low-cost uh, air quality multi sensor systems uh, to the to the to to this to this uh, to the this moment so they are the most reliable and accurate solution for uh, outdoor air quality monitoring um, 
for most of the um, of the pollutants we are looking at. Uh, you may see that they are at the core of several proven commercial solutions. So, uh, when I say proven, it's a limited proven uh, commercial solution. Uh, unfortunately, they are prone to uh, no cross interference and environmental uh, sensitivity. Uh, there are some some uh, some gas sensors that are prone to cross interference to non target gas, while the environmental sensitivity to environmental parameters is something that you can uh, is very common in this class of uh, sensors. So, but, but let's have a look to. Uh, uh, possible solution. One example we can we can do is to use uh, AlphaSense sensors. AlphaSense A4, B4 classes are one of the most tested sensors class in the in the literature. You may find it very commonly in the in the in the current literature. Um, and the estimation are basing on the um, potential of the working electrode with respect to a reference electrode. Uh, so we are talking about potentials. So one of the most common interference is the temperature, but no interference are also relative humidity and uh, temperature transits. Uh, pressure also and non-target gases like it, like for example uh, NO2, which act as an interference to the ozone sensor. Uh, usually, but in this, especially in this case of the alpha sensors, an auxiliary electrode provides for an estimation of temperature influence on the working electrode potential, which is good because we may use it to partially correct uh, the influence of temperature on the working uh, electrode potential. We know that the, uh, that the temperature elicits a response on the working electrode even in absence, even if the target gas is not present, and uh, we may use the reading from this auxiliary electrode that actually is uh, is not in contact with the with the uh, uh, is screened from the presence of the of the um, of the of the target uh, gases and the atmosphere in general and we will use the influence of the temperature the potential of this auxiliary electrode to correct for the uh, for the influence of temperature on the working electrode however this correction is not exact so we have to um, improve the correction with uh, an ad hoc uh, calibration. Unfortunately, the fabrication variants of the electrochemical sensors, this kind of electro uh, electrochemical sensors, forces us to, um, to derive an ad hoc calibration for each of the, of the sensors, at least in our basic uh, approach. So but the vendor distribute calibrated sensors also, which report the sensitivity and uh, the zero air uh, response on both working electrode and uh, auxiliary electrode. So as such, uh, we can derive the following uh, simple calibration scheme in which actually we multiply, um, we divide uh, um, the, um, uh, this quantity by the sensitivity. Uh, this quantity is actually the difference between the working electrode potential and the auxiliary electrode potential uh, further uh, corrected by uh, the, uh, the, the bias uh, response at the uh, zero air of this quantity, so the difference between uh, working electrode and auxiliary electrode potential. So, so but some basic correction uh, 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 is also provided, can be provided using the lookup table, which allows to correct the, 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 the auxiliary election, uh, electrode potential for, uh, for uh, uh, working electrode for temperature interference too. Uh, so far, this approach just uh, won't work in the field. So this is, um, uh, we have uh, in the literature, um, uh, several um, several evidence in which this approach uh, is not the uh, the best uh, performing uh, approach. So we will have further correction for sure, but factors like um, uh, fabrication variance and um, will basically uh, hinder this kind of uh, uh, approach. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, it does not take into account other non-target interference, like for example the ozone response to NO2. Uh, uh, it, it does not take into account sensor fabrication variability because uh, this lookup table is provided for um, for all the sensors or for a subset of sensors, uh, which uh, you see. So the variance 
uh, already in this uh, in this uh, uh, set of uh, of sensors uh, which are um, measured in the in the in the data sheet uh, is significant at particular uh, temperature levels, which by the way can be uh, actually uh, achieved in some region of, uh, of Europe. It is not uncommon here in, uh, in Naples to reach 40 degrees in the, in the, in the summertime. So, um, of course, you may also try to build your own lookup table by measuring your sensor in the lab, and this is some kind of uh, mixed approach. But let's have a look at, at our data-driven uh, approach. So we want to tune uh, a black box model using uh, field or lab calibrated um, uh, data. So what we want to obtain is always this function f, and this time x will take the, the shape of a vector with three components. One of them is uh, the working uh, electrode, uh, the other one is the auxiliary electrode, so we have information about um, the response of the sensors to um, the target gas concentration, we have information on the temperature uh, influence on, uh, on the working electrode by looking at the response of the auxiliary electrode, and we further have some other information from a temperature sensor. So we want to use this kind of vector as an input for a calibration factor that we want to, um, that we want to derive. So we can try different models like multilinear regressor, shallow neural networks, random ports, and so on. Uh, here are the results from uh, multilinear regressor. So we have uh, we obtain a very simple model. The target is the NO2 in this case, and the primary interference is the temperature. So uh, actually we are using the model that we have seen in the previous uh, slide. As you may see, here we have four different uh, multi-sensors devices porting uh, an NO2 uh, alpha sense A4 class uh, uh, device and a temperature um, sensor. And uh, um, here it's the reference provided by a regulatory grade analyzer. And we see that after the calibration, we are able to uh, actually be very, uh, very, very, very similar to the, to the uh, actual true uh, response for three of um, the sensors that we have tested. Uh, the approach has um, basically faded for um, the lowest range of uh, concentration in the lowest uh, range of concentration for one of the sensors that we were unable to calibrate with this kind of uh, approach. Uh, it is continuously keeping uh, um, a constant bias that uh, should be further corrected. So this approach have uh, worked fine for three out of four of our, uh, of our sensors. And here it's also, uh, let's see, to, uh, let's see uh, a table that you may find uh, in the, uh, the literature uh, comparing uh, different multi-sensors device performance for two different models. Okay. Uh, at different length of the calibration uh, duration, the collocation uh, duration. So we are trying to understand in this particular experiment the short-term performance by using a three months collocation data set. It is winter time, so we have high pollutant concentration, so this is, has to be uh, taken into account. We have four Monica devices based on the AlphaSense A4S. Um, uh, class sensors. So, what we uh, this uh, this table uh, tell us. So um, here, for example, we can analyze the performance of the AQ number six sensors when it's trained with different length of the training uh, data set. Okay. So one week, two week, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, and we see that the uh, the um, this is the mean absolute error. That mean absolute, uh, mean absolute error is going down and down as long as we uh, enlarge the, num the number of uh, weeks we are, uh, of data that we are considering for uh, the, the training. Okay, but we also see that here, from going for, uh, from four to five, 
uh, we does not obtain a significant amelioration. So what we can spot here, and this you, you can find it in, 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 uh, in uh, throughout all uh, this table. Here, for example, we are considered the Pearson's correlation coefficient, and here the uh, coefficient of determination. We see that we, uh, we do not obtain a significant uh, amelioration. Uh, when we go beyond three to four weeks. So um, by uh, looking at the results of this kind of uh, table, you can decide how long you need to collocate your uh, instrument to obtain um, uh, a sufficiently accurate response from, uh, from your census uh, in the short term. So we are talking about three months collocation. So all the, the data, all the, the performance that we are um, uh, estimating here, all the performance indicators are valid in the short term. Okay, we also can look quantitatively at the mean absolute error, which ranges in the range of five micrograms per cubic meters to 12 micrograms uh, for cubic meters. And uh, the coefficient uh, determination, which ranges from zero set uh, 0.7 to 0 0.9, uh, which is a rather interesting value. And uh, we also can compare, for example, neural networks and multilinear relays, and we see that the results obtained in this particular setting are very similar. In that case, we would prefer the simplest approach of a multilinear uh, regress. But let's have a look at how to uh, select the correct model. Up to now, we uh, have conveyed some uh, kind of information related to the shape of a, a calibration function, the motivation, so how we actually calibrate um, um, our sensor, uh, and also we have seen how to evaluate the accuracy and the precision of our models by looking at the results of our um, calibration function. We also have seen two different approaches, lab calibration and uh, field calibration. And we also we have seen, look at, at the difference between these two approaches. And then we have made some uh, example of field calibration into specific um, uh, scenarios. But we need now to uh, have a look on how to select the data that are used to derive the calibration. We have also already encountered several black model, black box model, uh, and we have also seen that in that case, particular case, the comparison highlighted that many hold similar results, which is something that is commonly find, found. Uh, but to avoid over-optimistic results, these indicators uh, have been counted on, um, on uh, estimation performance during a set apart called uh, set, called test set, as opposed to the so-called training set. So what we have done, we have divided uh, our data set into basic sets, a set of data that have been used to derive the calibration and the other one that is used to evaluate the performance. This process is called validation. We want to understand and we want to estimate uh, how our system will perform when it will be deployed in actual real world field condition. But how we set the appropriate partition, how much data we use, we have also had a glimpse there by looking at the uh, different length of the training set and we have seen that the performance get better initially when we have a larger and larger training set but by reaching uh, by reaching a peculiar value in that case was it was something like three weeks uh, we reach a plateau so it's it is uh, not worth to extend the calibration uh, the collocation period more than three weeks. The first question that we have to pose to ourselves is which base model we will use. 
So far, the comparison in literature showed no clear winner. There are some clues that some, uh, some peculiar models may uh, generalize well in real-world condition, but uh, in truth, there is no uh, clear winner up to one. There are some clues that we will see in the, in the, uh, in the next uh, um, uh, lecture. So, if adequately optimized, with a fair choice of the hyperparameters, so the parameters of the structural parameters of the, of the models, they will provide similar results. Typical example that you may find will be multilinear regression, see before, artificial neural networks. Typically, we use shallow architectures, random forest, uh, which already have shown to provide bad generalization properties, but it's very simple to understand uh, why, uh, super vector machines, and so on. Of course, if you need to perform this kind of uh, calibration, hmm, on um, low power operated on low um, computation capabilities uh, hardware, then the choice of which model to use may be led by your hardware. Uh, if you perform the calibration on board of a um, air quality uh, low cost multi sensor system, then you have to, uh, uh, to consider what are the real. Uh, computational capabilities of your hardware. Okay. But depending on application, for example, recurrent architectures, which are uh, a little bit more complex, uh, uh, artificial neural network architectures, or in general, uh, um, uh, they may provide a performance boost when dealing with fast transits, which may be of interest in case of mobile uh, um, uh, application. So with this uh, set of considera uh, consideration, we may go further and choose our uh, first um, uh, calibration model uh, to uh, begin our experimentation. Uh, as I said before, random forest is, uh, is just to provide bad generalization properties when it's forced to operate in conditions which are um, outside the boundaries of what uh, has been uh, seen in the training or what is uh, uh, has been considered during the training set. Uh, that's basically because uh, random forest will uh, each of the each of the three of the random forest will output uh, a constant value outside of the range of the values that uh, he has been trained uh, with. It has been trained. So basically, we fail to provide the correct answer outside of the train. Uh, so what does uh, emerge from uh, this set of consideration analyzing the literature is that we have to keep it simple. So simple models provide usually better generalization and avoids overtraining. This is a general rule you have to take into account when you use a black box model. Uh, but Let's uh, have a look at how to uh, partition your data set. So how much data to use for training, how much to use uh, for setup. Your main goal uh, will be basically to provide realistic evaluation of the accuracy. So to avoid over-optimistic conclusion coming from overtraining, um, you have to select the right amount of needed data in a cost slash accuracy trade-off uh, you, you would like to select the best model in terms of generalization to real world condition. So all this consideration, all this target will lead your, your choices. The most important question, by the way, is how will I use the model? Will I use the model during short term, real world condition, but in short term, during long term campaigns? Uh, will, will, do, do I have multiple season data? We will come to this later in the, in the, in, in the next um, uh, lecture where we will analyze the limitation. But then, how many data do I have? This is the main, the main question. So first, you have to avoid correlation between training and test data in order to achieve um, realistic estimation of your accuracy mm? and to, to avoid over-optimistic conclusion on this. Okay, this is very important. Okay, this is the first rule. So avoid correlation, whatever kind of correlation between training 
and, and, uh, and this data, which is actually most of the time obtained by partitioning the data in a training data and in a test in a test data, which are coes. Okay, so using, for example, this is the time all the all the data from the start, for example, from the beginning of your data set up to uh, a certain time, and then use the remaining of the data as a test data, which, which simulate uh, what uh, actually um, uh, happens in a real world condition in which you will train your uh, by collocating your. Uh, uh, low-cost multi-sensor quality device with the reference analyzers, you obtain your, um, uh, your data, you derive your data-driven uh, black, black, box, black box model, and then you actually deploy your sensors. And you actually, you want to uh, test, your, uh, test your systems on real condition. So this is a very, uh, very simple yet very effective uh, partition. Okay. However, the performance may depend, actually they depend, believe me, on the peculiar condition during the training set and during the test time periods, of course, especially when you're, uh, when you're dealing with um, uh, long-term uh, deployment. So uh, what you can uh, do to um, To have a remediation on this, so to limit the influence of this uh, of uh, this uh, issue, uh, try to be uh, avoid to be uh, uh, dependent on specific training test conditions. So cross validation. So cross validation is a process in which you average your performance indicator across different conditions of training, different choices of training and test data. In general, what works be best. With this, uh, uh, with the, in our scenario, is to uh, obtain this kind of uh, um, partition in which you have the training that moves along the collocation time. Okay, and you test the data on the uh, a subset of the remaining data. Okay, so you have a shift of the training test couple uh, data set that we have seen before along the time. Okay. This avoid to be uh, particularly dependent. This avoid your uh, performance indicator to be dependent by uh, the actual training and test data you have selected. Okay, because you actually train in different condition. There will be slightly different condition, but by the way, it is something that it limits the, the issue that we have seen before. So. The, the key is average your performance indicator across different training test choices. Okay, so, but if you feel you that you don't have enough data to do so, to have a reliable estimation of the of um, uh, the um, uh, of the performance, uh, which happens uh, in short term deployment, for example, you may. Uh, you may uh, use a different cross-validation scheme in which you use all the remaining data for testing. This will be slightly uh, over-optimistic, but one of the best approach in this condition which you have uh, uh, a limited amount of data. Why I say that this is slightly over-optimistic? Because there will be some uh, correlation between the condition which, is, which are encountered in, during the training and the condition of part of the test data on two boundaries, which are here and there. Okay? While in the original uh, proposition, uh, you will have the, uh, this, uh, this issue only in, a, uh, in half uh, uh, the condition in which uh, this happens in, uh, with this approach. Okay, so this is, will be slightly uh, over-optimistic, but when you have uh, not enough data, uh, this one approach that may be worth to, uh, to follow. So let's do uh, an example of case two with our uh, usual table. Uh, and we have uh, uh, another, uh, another setting. We uh, have, uh, still have an O2 target 
calibration. We are still comparing uh, multilinear regression and shallow neural network, but this time we have a long-term uh, experiment. Actually, we have several different experiments, and they range from one year deployment to two years. Okay, so let's have a look at the, at the, at the table. Here you see on this axis different um, uh, duration of the training uh, uh, of the training test. Um, the caption here uh, reads that we are doing NO2 calibration with cross validation. We have the first one um, uh, with the, uh, the, the second approach in which we uh, um, let the training to move across the, the, the training set and we actually test only for the remaining part. And uh, what we see is that uh, this is basically one year, slightly more than one year uh, collocation. And we see that, again, by uh, using uh, more or less three uh, to four weeks uh, of data, we actually obtain already uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, optimal uh, value. So there is no real uh, uh, improvement when using more than four weeks in that specific scenario in which we have a cohesive training set. So starting from the first point and then uh, ending after one week, two weeks, three weeks or four weeks uh, uh, of data and then testing on all the remaining part of the year. So uh, what we are talking about in terms of uh, squared error. So we are talking about uh, the range between 0 0.49, 0 0.5, which is um, which is a, a, a lower score with respect to the one that we have seen before, range from 0 0.7 to 0 0.9 in uh, three weeks. But we are talking about one year of uh, actual field deployment. If we look at the second table, we look at what happened in the following year. So we have the same approach in the uh, following year. Even here, we have slightly more than one year of, of data. And if we look at R squared, we, uh, we, uh, we uh, understand that there was um, uh, a hit on the, uh, on the performance because even in the best condition, we go from 0 0.5 more or less to 0, point, uh, to 0 0.4. So there has been a performance hit in the second year. Okay, even if we calibrate again at the beginning of this new year. Okay, uh, again, we have, uh, we have made the same uh, experiment by looking at what happens with one week, two weeks, three weeks, and four weeks of uh, calibration uh, data. So there is a difference between the two here. In the quality, this very same multi-sensor systems can, uh, can achieve when calibrated in the same condition. The third one is uh, a calibration that uh, starts from April 2018 and ends on November 2020. So we have more than two years of uh, calibration. And if we look, we are just using uh, four weeks. OK, and what we see uh, is that we uh, have a further decrease of the air square uh, performance, but we are talking here of having a system calibrated for four weeks and then tested on the remaining part of a two year, two years um, uh, data set. But what happens if instead of um, uh, cross-validating, we just made uh, a choice by looking at just one experiment with initial four weeks used and the remaining uh, that I said, it's called an ab initio um, calibration. So we would have found something that is under optimistic because um, our um, our S squared uh, would have been found in uh, 0 0.18. So this is not over optimistic. This is sensible to particular condition that have been encountered during that first month of deployment. Evidently, these conditions are not were not sufficiently 
uh, representing what happened in the remaining two years. Maybe that, that was a very stable con weather conditions and was not enough, um, um, it's not containing enough information uh, to have a complete description of the sensor behavior. So if we summarize what we have found uh, in the first year, for example, in the one year uh, long uh, uh, experiment, we see that uh, shallow neural network and multilinear regression had similar results. Uh, four weeks obtained the best figures in a trade-off uh, with the accuracy and uh, training set length. S squared falls significantly on the two years experiment. And, but again, even in two years, the multilinear regression offer better generalization uh, performance by uh, overperforming the uh, shallow neural network. And this is very uh, important. In the final part of this presentation, we will have a look at the issues that affect the field calibration robustness in the long term. We have seen already that when we calibrate uh, in a limited, with a limited amount of data, but even for uh, four weeks, like one month, can be a limited amount of data when you look at performance obtainable in two years of uh, deployment. What, what really happens? What happens if we relocate the calibration, the calibrated station? Why the field calibration performance drops? We have seen, we can, we can see in, uh, in recent literature, uh, uh, an increasing number of researchers are um, showing uh, that results of field calibration drops during time. And why the performance of field, uh, calibration uh, drops? What is the, the answer to this question? The basic question, uh, the basic answer is that because the, uh, trains net, the training set is not complete enough to deal with the variance that is observed in long-term deployment of the, of the sensor. So what, what is obtained is that we teach the calibration function to, uh, to respond to a limited set, a limited variance uh, um, data set. When the sensors, when the calibrator function uh, is forced to operate outside that particular boundary of data, uh, that have been seen during the, the training set, the accuracy starts to drop. So the reasons why behind change. Change in the pollutant range, for example, change in the pollutant mix, for example, the composition of the atmospheric particulate, um, change in the ratio between different uh, uh, targets. So if we teach uh, a calibrator to uh, correctly answer to a range of uh, um, analyte concentration, uh, then we cannot expect, uh, especially when a nonlinear uh, uh, sensor uh, behavior is underlying, uh, to, 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 to answer correctly when the range is significantly different. So what, for example, we have shown in one of our particular, uh, in, in our, uh, our recent work together with uh, Nilu, which is another partner of, of the PD uh, project, is that when uh, different conditions are encountered in the training and the test set, the uh, performance uh, drops. And this difference is actually computable by looking at the difference between the uh, distribution of the forces. And the forces include, of course, the target, the non-target gas interference, and also environmental condition. In this case, we are, we are looking at the temperature variation. And we see that the best performance are obtained when the same distribution is encountered in training and test while the worst ones are obtained 
when uh, the condition in which the systems are tested are really different from the condition encountered during the training set. And here we are just looking at the temperature, which is just one of the, um, of the variables which induce a response in, in, in the sensors. And we have also quantified this in this kind of graphs. What we see is that when the uh, distance, in the case, the normalized the Euclidean distance between the, uh, between the distribution functions uh, grows, then also the, uh, the uh, mean absolute error, in this case, uh, grows. Uh, and this is a clear sign of, uh, uh, of the influence of the difference in the, uh, in, uh, in the condition influencing the actual uh, performance. But we will have uh, a look more in deep in the uh, uh, next lecture. What uh, it is important to, uh, to look at that in, this, uh, uh, in these lectures is that there are strategies to boost the robustness. Okay. Most of them tackle the uh, calibration set completeness hmm? in order to, uh, to, to, to be able to face the condition variance. For example, the recalibration, it is recalibration, um, uh, continuous recalibration or timely recalibration will help to, uh, to boost uh, the performance over the time of the, uh, of the calibrator. Of course, this comes to a cost. You need to have the availability of fresh data and also fresh reference data. Okay. Or you can act on improving the generalization capabilities of the model. There are some approaches that are promises in, in, uh, in this case, but we will have a look more in deeper in, uh, in the next uh, lectures. So let's have a wrap up. So what we have learned in this, uh, in this lesson. So chemical and particulate matter sensors need calibration to optimi optimize their performance. Some of them come with uh, an original uh, calibration with the, which make them out of the box capable of performing an estimation. Some of them uh, comes without this kind of original, let's say, calibration. So you need to calibrate it anyway. Okay. Field calibration currently obtained the most for operating in real condition in the wild, currently. But seasonalities and relocation also, so any change in the forces distribution, basically, with respect to what encountered during the, the calibration, will lead to a performance loss. Furthermore, the fabrication variance and, and so the needs for local and periodic recalibration, basically in the scalability. From the commercial point of view, this is very costly. So you need to have a different, uh, separate calibration for each of the multi-sensors you will develop and you want to sell. Uh, and every now and then you need to, pay, to have a periodic recalibration. And don't forget, you need the access to a reference analyzer in order to recalibrate. So this basically um, hinder the possibility to achieve scalability with basic field calibration approaches. Remote and global calibration models are promising approach to obtain this sort of scalability. And we will have a look at this in the next lectures. So thank you for your attention. And uh, let's each other to the next lecture.